On this episode, we preview the 2004 National Congress of Pedestrian Advocates. The National Safe Kids Campaign works to keep young pedestrians safe. A new study by the EPA finds that walkable schools create less auto pollution. Finally, we drop in on the League of American Bicyclists. Stay tuned. We're in Silver Spring, Maryland, talking with Bill Smith, who's chair of the host committee for the 2004 National Congress of Pedestrian Advocates. What is the National Congress? Uh, well, it's a gathering of uh, pedestrian advocates and public officials, public health officials, uh, urban planners, uh, people from all over the country. It's it's really hard to say exactly what it is in in a, in a short amount of time because it's it's so many different things. Um, but it's it's folks who are interested in pedestrian uh, accessibility uh, issues and um, uh, public the public health implications of of um, pedestrian friendly communities uh, um, and the Congress uh, is kind of a this year it's really going to be kind of a discussion of uh, what the issues are and hopefully folks will be able to to expand their network uh, advocates will be able to expand their network and and meet some folks and 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 be introduced to some some perspectives on the issue that they're that they either don't, are unaware about or have have always been interested in but have never really taken the time to to go and get the information on those different perspectives now what's the job of the host committee what have you been working on our first job was to get the con the conference in Silver Spring and uh, we put together a coalition of um, a dozen or so uh, organizations locally, federally, uh, at the federal level, the local level, um, government agencies, individuals, uh, advocacy organizations, um, public health advocacy organizations, a lot of different folks are involved in the, in the host committee. Um, and what the host committee has been doing s since getting the bid in, in, uh, in May of 2003 has been to um, uh, pool our resources, uh, come up with some ideas and, and some direction for the Congress. Um, a lot of the host committee members are, are, are presenting at the Congress. Um, financial support comes from the host committee and from their network of people. Have you selected a theme for the Congress yet? Yeah, the theme this year is walking everybody's business, revitalizing people and places. And um, the, that kind of encompasses some a, a lot of the focus of the Congress. We're talking about how um, uh, walkable communities affect people, how, how, um, how they affect places, and, and how they affect uh, business, um, how they affect people's uh, health, how uh, their mental attitude, their emotional attitude. Um, so the, the theme kind of reflects all of those different perspectives. What are the, the dates of the Congress and, and what's going to be going on on the different days? Uh, it's May 6th, 7th, and 8th, 2004. It's downtown Silver Spring at the Hilton. Um, that we, We've got uh, somewhere in the order of 35 or 40 programs, uh, presentations that people will be delivering. Some of them uh, will be um, classic, you know, workshop sessions in a, in a conference room, and some of them will be mobile workshops where we go out and look at, uh, uh, for example, uh, the, the Safe Routes to School pilot project, which is only about a couple of miles from, from where the Congress is taking place. We'll be, a lot of folks will be going out there and discussing that particular safety, pedestrian safety for children, pedestrian safety around schools, and some of the in innovative projects that are taking place in Maryland and across the country to, to, to improve that situation. Uh, folks go back home with ideas from the Congress. You don't have to go very far to go back home. What do you hope your county will get by having the Congress here? There's been a lot of interest in this topic, in this issue, in, in the whole uh, range of issues surrounding pedestrians in Montgomery County, in, in the state of Maryland, and, and across the country. And it's a growing issue. Um, a lot of folks have picked up on it on a political level. 
uh, they they realize that there's some interest and energy and support there, and and politicians and government officials, you know, that's what they do. They play towards where the interest of the public lies. Um, the substantive part of that, though, is always kind of lagging behind the political part. So while there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of talk about it, the the action is a little, you know, a little further behind. Um, personally, I hope that uh, in Montgomery County that we have a, a renewed, inv more invigorated uh, interest in this in the in, in pedestrian accessibility and, and building and, and designing walkable communities and and um, codes that that help pedestrians survive in this car generated society that we're in um, and um, that we'll will have some that these, these folks that the government officials from Montgomery County will be next to pedestrian advocates for long enough time talking about this in a serious way that they'll come away from it with some more of the substantive um, tools that and 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 reinvigorated to, to do this, to, to actually make it happen rather than just talk about it. We're in Washington, D.C., talking with Angela Michalide, who's program director with the National Safe Kids Campaign. What is Safe Kids? The National Safe Kids Campaign is an organization dedicated to preventing unintentional childhood injury. We focus on a number of risk factors, motor vehicle occupants, burns, drowning, falls, choking, and we have a national headquarters here in Washington and more than 600 chapters and coalitions all across the United States. And how does it work with uh, the headquarters and then your chapters and coalitions? Well, at the national office we develop programs that are multifaceted. They combine education, safety devices, environmental change recommendations, uh, legislative policies, and technical assistance for our coalitions to work in their communities to keep children safe. Our coalitions are usually led by hospitals or health departments and it's 20 to 30 members of the community, law enforcement, teachers, clinicians and the like who come together on a very regular basis to implement the programs that we develop here nationally. How big a problem is pedestrian safety for children? Well, actually, it's the second leading cause of death among children ages 5 to 14. Every year in this country, more than 700 children die, and another 47,000 are injured seriously enough to require emergency medical care. So it's a really substantial problem. I assume you're doing something about it. Well, you know, collectively, the field of injury prevention has been successful. Since between 1987 and the year 2000, we've seen a 51% decline in pedestrian deaths to kids. So that's the good news. But the bad news is that it remains the second leading cause of death in this country. So we really must be doing more as a community and as a society. And what sort of program is uh, Safe Kids doing? Well, we have a wonderful program with uh, sponsorship from FedEx called Walk, uh, Safe Kids Walk This Way. And this is a program that combines public ed education with data collection, with environmental change, and with advocacy that's really making a difference across the United States. And what sort of things are your uh, local coalitions able to do with, uh, with this program? Well, every year in October, our coalitions participate in International Walk to School Day. This is one day of the year where we ask parents to walk with their children in order to teach them safe behaviors and to raise awareness of pedestrian injury. Our next day will be on October the 6th, 2004. And, uh, your viewing audience will be able to participate in so many of the activities happening here in D.C., Montgomery County, P.G. County, and all over Virginia. What, what role do your corporate sponsors play in, in this sort of program? Well, our corporate sponsors play a tremendous role in that they give us the financial support and media services support to help us both uh, facilitate the program and advertise it. For example, with uh, the FedEx Express relationship, we've been able to develop educational materials for parents, for children, and for teachers. We've been able to conduct research all across the country, so they've paid for the tools and, our, and, and all of the analysis from, by our staff. And they're also very helpful in um, 
providing large grants to our coalitions through Safe Kids to set up pedestrian task forces around the United States. What we've been doing everywhere uh, is going into communities, working with the local leaders to try to figure out what the problem is. Where are children having difficulty crossing the street? Where are they being hit? And then working with the municipal bodies to make physical changes in that environment so that children aren't at risk when they cross. And you mentioned uh, research mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, Walk to School Day. What sort of research project did you have going on? Well, a few years back, we were measuring speeding in school zones. We asked our coalitions to go out 30 minutes before school started and 30 minutes after school ended with law enforcement to uh, measure the speed of cars. And we found that, surprisingly, two-thirds of all of the cars in the school zone were speeding during that time frame. And what we found remarkable about that is that in 90% of the cases, there were speed calming devices present, a stop light, a stop sign, speed bumps, uh, traffic um, officials, crossing guards and the like. And what's most troubling is that parents anticipate that their children are safest in these pedestrian, in the school-related pedestrian environment. We assume that we're all looking out for each other's children, and the fact that two-thirds of the cars were speeding tells me that that's not the case. We did another study the following year. We had 9,000 children on International Walk to School Day rate their walk to school as to how hazardous it was. And we found that 60% of the children identified at least one major hazard on their walk to school. A broken stop light, uh, a lack of crossing markings in the street, speeding cars, streets that were too wide for them to cross, and lack of sidewalks in many communities. And this is a real problem because we want our children to be walking to, to school or biking to school because it's good for their health. But we have to ensure that those environments are safe so that they won't be injured. And other research you've done more recently, what did you come up with this year? Well, this past year we were interested in looking at uh, violations of the stop sign in communities. And once again, we measured over the course of a few months 25,000 cars in both school and residential areas and how they were behaving as they approached the stop sign. And we found that 70% of all of the drivers were violating the stop sign in some way. 7% uh, rolled right through it and didn't even stop. Another 37% rolled, slowed down, uh, but never came to, you know, they, they rolled sort of through it, didn't come to a complete stop. And another 25% uh, stopped, but inside the crosswalk, which forced our children then to go out into the lane of oncoming traffic in order to get to their, the other side of the street. So we really need to be working with motorists to make them aware of how important it is to stop appropriately. With the children themselves, they can't just assume that a driver will stop or, or slow down. And with um, the, the teaching community, we have to mobilize the teachers and the administration to try to make their environments safe for kids. We're at the University of Maryland at College Park talking with Professor Reed Ewing with the National Center for Smart Growth. What is the center? Uh, it's a center that was created under the Glendenning administration uh, to uh, do research uh, and education in the area of smart growth. Uh, basically figuring out what works and then uh, disseminating information so we'll grow smarter, um, not just in Maryland, but all, yeah, nationwide. And earlier this year, you authored a study for the EPA on schools. Yep. What was the study? What did you look at? Uh, we looked at... Um, uh, generally, at the, the, the whole issue of, of kids not walking to uh, school anymore, uh, rather uh, riding with their parents or, or taking school buses, uh, the, the consequences of that in terms of kids' health and, and their weight. Uh, and we focused on their, their choice uh, of mode of travel to school and, um, and modeled it, if you will, uh, trying to determine what variables were significant in the uh, in the decision to walk, and, and kids still do, not large numbers, but they still do, uh, versus uh, uh, riding with their parents. Uh, we found that uh, there were some very important variables, and some things we thought would be important weren't. 
Okay, well, let's start out with what was important. Well, what was important and what was most important was the distance. And um, as uh, the distances grow, uh, uh, the probability or likelihood that a kid's going to walk to school drops off pretty dramatically. Uh, same thing with, with bicycling. And uh, that implies that we should be building or neighborhood schools or, or you know, maintaining the ones we have rather than uh, moving out to uh, the hinterland and remote sites uh, and uh, putting schools there because uh, the, the walk to school or the bike to school is going to be too long in those, in those environments. So that was the most important variable. Uh, sidewalks were also important. Having uh, sidewalks on, on arterials and collectors uh, proved to be a significant variable. Um, not as big an impact as the uh, length of the trip, the distance that is, uh, but uh, still significant. Uh, the number of cars that a household owns was also significant. The, those, those households with more cars uh, per person uh, were less likely to have kids uh, walk to school, and that kind of makes sense. Uh, so those were the significant variables. Uh, not significant, and, and at least in this particular study, uh, was school size, which surprised us a little bit, but we may have captured that through the length of the trip to school. Bigger, bigger schools would, would draw from larger areas. Uh, some other uh, in, uh, environmental variables that we thought would be important, like uh, population density, uh, was not uh, in this particular study. But again, we may have captured that indirectly. But the, the, the bottom line is that, uh, that uh, where a school is located uh, is an important determinant of whether kids are going to walk to school and then ultimately of all sorts of other things like uh, uh, vehicle emissions associated with the school trip. What's the trend been over the last several decades on the number of students walking to school and, and how the significant variables you discovered might affect that? A uh, dramatic drop in the uh, proportion of, of kids walking to school. Uh, if you go back to the first nationwide uh, personal transportation survey, uh, which was in the late 60s, something like half of the kids uh, walked to, uh, walk to school or, or bike to school. Uh, we're now down to a little less than 15 percent walking and about 1 percent bicycling to school. So that's, that's dramatic. Uh, even, even on the short uh, trips to school, less than a mile. It used to be about 90% of the kids walking or bicycling, and uh, we're down to less than a third now. So dramatic. At the same time, schools have gotten larger and larger. Um, since the war, the average size of uh, public schools has increased by a factor of five. So we get the bigger schools, and we get the declining walking and bicycling, and uh, we've talked a little bit already about the implications for health. And the EPA, um, certainly, your findings regarding the impact on pollution would be of interest to them. How big is the impact on pollution? Very large, uh, actually larger than I expected. Uh, we, we did uh, one simulation and then we did an actual comparison of, of two, high two high schools. Um, one high school uh, is, is, say, the area we were studying is Gainesville, Florida. One high school uh, is central. It's, it's called Gainesville High School. It's an older high school in a neighborhood. Uh, then there's Eastside High, which was uh, out on the east side, kind of remote. Um, no one could walk there. So 100% of the kids um, uh, come by vehicle to Eastside High, and they're about 15% walk to Gainesville High School. Uh, plus that the, the auto trips to Gainesville are much shorter because it's centrally located. Uh, and the difference in emission levels is, is greater than, uh, you know, 50 percent. That is, that is the, all, uh, per trip, uh, the emissions associated with a school trip, the average school trip to Gainesville High, are less than half uh, the uh, average emissions associated with the trip to uh, Eastside High. So very big impact. And, of course, that was what EPA was interested in, concerned about. This was a fairly technical report, taking a look with hard statistics. What's the importance of, of doing that kind of technical report to tell us some things that we probably thought we knew anyway? Yeah, yeah that's so true. Um, well, you're, you're, you're right. It's pretty obvious, I guess, in a sense. But I, I guess the, uh, the importance is, in, in part, um, just adding a lot of um, credence to an idea that was intu intuitive. You can now point to a study 
uh, it will ultimately be a peer-reviewed study in some journal, and, and that adds to the uh, weight of arguments uh, in favor of neighborhood schools. Um, when you do a study like this, you also quantify effects. Uh, you, you now know the magnitude. I can, I can tell you, for example, uh, if, if the, um, at least in this, in this particular environment, Gainesville's, if the average uh, uh, school trip length were reduced to about a half a mile, uh, the number of kids walking to school uh, we, we simulate would be a uh, little over 10 percent. It's now less than, less than five. Uh, the number of bicycling would increase from about uh, 3 percent to 11 percent if you could keep the trips that short, which implies neighborhood schools again. So quantifying impacts is important. Um, I think also it just um, it, it kind of makes things real to people when they see numbers. It certainly makes things much more newsworthy than they are. Um, intuitive arguments are nice, but uh, numbers also count. We're in Washington, D.C., talking with Malay Williams, who's Director of Government Relations with the League of American Bicyclists. What is the League? The League? It's the League of American Bicyclists. We've been around since the 1880s. Uh, we were originally established as the League of American Wheelmen, and we're responsible for having our roads paved to begin with. And government Relations, why is that important to the League? It's important because we have a Congress here in Washington, D.C. who's making decisions on all of our lives, uh, one of those being how funds are spent at the state level on transportation needs. And there are many folks out there who ride bicycles as their primary form of transportation, and we want to ensure that they have safe places to ride. And you do stuff outside of D.C. You have something called Bicycle Friendly Communities. Absolutely. What's that all about? The Bicycle Friendly Communities program is a program that we've revamped uh, in the past year to where cities can compete to get a bicycle friendly status. There are three levels of awards, actually four levels of awards, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. A city will apply for the award. They uh, submit the application to us. It's reviewed. If they meet certain criteria, it's sent back to them. They do a second round of applications, and then we have peers and professionals review the applications and select award statuses if they qualify. And then there's a huge celebration. They get big street signs uh, to put in their neighborhoods. And it's a huge uh, positive thing for them as well as for the bicyclists in the communities. And the city's trying to improve its uh, bicycle infrastructure, its bicycle policies. What should they be doing that would uh, allow them to have a one of the, uh, let's, become, let's say become a gold city. There are a lot of criteria that they would need to be a, a gold criteria. It's not just one thing. Yeah. It's not just having bike lanes or wider shoulders or education programs in place. There are a lot of different things that a city can do to help them get that status. Clearly not all cities do the same things. Uh, a gold level city in one place may have totally different infrastructure in place than a gold city uh, in another place. So it, it really depends. There's a whole variety of criteria. If they meet so much of it, then they can qualify. And you s expect over time that uh, low-level uh, recipient might graduate to higher levels if they show the commitment? <laughs> we certainly hope so. I mean, that is, that is uh, why we revamped the program. We had a bicycle-friendly communities program in place and a community would achieve that status and then they would achieve the status and do nothing else. Uh, with this new program, once a city achieves the status or a town, they keep that status for two years and then they have to reapply to make sure they can, can maintain that status. If they've done further improvements with any once it's reviewed, they could move up into the next level. And we have had uh, communities that are already doing this and we're only we've just completed our second round third round's coming up in March. So what are, what are the best cities you've seen so far? Well, some of our better cities that are at least at gold level, uh, we have none at platinum level yet because we want to make sure that there's always room for improvement. Uh, Palo Alto is at the gold level. Uh, Portland is at the gold level. Um, they do phenomenal things, but even Palo Alto realizes that they have room to grow. In fact, when we uh, gave the award to Palo Alto, uh, it was awarded around 5 o'clock at the county council meeting, and uh, they were still meeting around 11.30 and were discussing a project, and someone had pointed out, wow, if we're ever going to reach platinum status, we probably should fund this 
program. So they voted to fund the program, and, and so we see already how BFCs are improving communities. Advocates and others are going to be coming here to Washington in March. What's going on? The fourth annual National Bike Summit is going to be from March 3rd through the 5th here in Washington, like we've done in years past. Uh, people will come into town on Wednesday. We have an entire day of training, uh, education sessions. We have some advocacy training later in the afternoon, and then we send everyone to the Hill on Thursday to talk to Congress. Uh, we anticipate this year, once again, we will be talking to Congress about reauthorization of T21, which we anticipate probably will still not have been passed at that time. What's the importance of having advocates walking the halls of Congress? Congress needs to know that there are bicyclists out there that do care about their communities and, and do want to see improvements and what type of improvements they would like to see. And this gives us the opportunity to go to the Hill, talk to individual members, um, bring the bicycling message, not only here in Washington, but we also train the advocates to take the message back home and have these same conversations with members of Congress when they're home and their state legislators, and their mayors, and their governors. So it's, it's a whole national program. It's not just focused here in the Beltway. Um, speaking of mayors, you have something else going on at the same time for the first time this year. What are you doing with mayors? Well, during the time period of the summit, which again is March 3rd through the 5th, on the 4th, while our advocates and our industry folks are up on the Hill talking to members of Congress, we hope to have many of our nation's mayors and several international mayors meeting at the World Bank on the first international symposium of bicycle communities, bicycle friendly communities. And we, it is our desire that they will sign a charter at that point in time committing to going home and making their communities bicycle friendly. And what opportunities are there for mayors in different parts of the world? To learn from each other? Well, as, as bicyclists out there know, some of our friends in, in European countries uh, have far exceeded us uh, in, in developing bicycle-friendly places. And so we hope that they're going to come here and share with us some of the things that they're doing there, but also take away with them that there are communities here in the U.S. who are striving to meet some and get to their level and, and that we are doing work here. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.